national emergency. We've got Senate Judiciary Committee Republican John Kennedy on the legal fallout coming. Border Patrol Union Chief Brandon Judd on what his agents are already doing. And California Democrat John Garrett Mindy on his state already suing. And here comes the hearings. Did James Comey's number two guy just do a number on the Trump Russia probe? Why Democrat Mark Penn says yes, former Whitewater special counsel Ken Starr says no. And House Intelligence ranking Republican Devin Nunes says it's time to hold certain investigators accountable now. All three are here. In Amazon, local leaders lashing out so now Amazon is out. Ditching plans for a new headquarters in New York City and taking thousands of jobs with it. Are certain lawmakers really happy about this? We're on it. Plus, neither red nor blue is worried about your green as the nation's debt now $22 trillion and counting. But you wouldn't know it with another presidential election coming. Is this the national emergency everyone should be watching? Kavuto Live starts right now. In a Fox News alert, we are getting word police will be providing new information on that deadly workplace Tomorrow, shooting in Aurora, we've Illinois. Had a lot of fun with you. As you Gunmen know, killing five co workers at the Henry Pratt manufacturing plant before police killed him. Five officers also wounded in a rampage. What are investigators learning about the suspect? A press conference will be getting underway at the top of the next hour. Meanwhile, to our top story this hour, I'm Charles Payne, in for Neil Cavuto. President Trump, he's in Mar-a-Lago after declaring a national emergency at the border, and the lawsuits are already piling up. Fox News correspondent Phil Keating is in West Palm Beach with the latest. Phil. Good morning, Charles. Yes, those lawsuits filed by three Texas landowners as well as an environmental group all protesting this border wall construction. The White House has indicated they fully expected lawsuits and are working on preparing themselves to handle them all. Here in sunny South Florida today, it's going to be a high of 80, just to make you jealous. And President Trump left his Mar-a-Lago Palm Beach mansion early this morning and has now arrived at Trump International Golf Club, where he is presumably hitting the links. Air Force One landed last night here in West Palm Beach right around 6.30 p.m. The president has no public events scheduled all weekend long. Earlier Friday at the Rose Garden, President Trump announced he was signing the budget deal, averting another partial government shutdown. However, also declaring a national emergency over the southern border with Mexico. And with that, he plans to take funds from other sources to get more money for the wall than the compromise legislation gives. What we want, really want to do is simple. It's not like it's complicated. It's very simple. We want to stop drugs from coming into our country. We want to stop criminals and gangs from coming into our country. The budget deal gives about $1.4 billion for border fence construction. The administration seeks extra wall money from here. $1.37 billion from Homeland Security, $600 million from the Treasury, $2.5 billion from the Department of Defense's drug program, and $3.5 billion from DOD military construction budgets. Democrats are wholly expected to challenge this national emergency declaration in the courts. In this joint statement by Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, quote, this is plainly a power grab by a disappointed president who has gone outside the bounds of the law to try to get what he failed to achieve in the constitutional legislative process. Another challenge could come directly from California, the state which sees the biggest imprint of illegal immigration in their state. Governor Gavin Newsom, a Democrat yesterday, calling the border wall a monument to stupidity. Uh, but back to the lawsuit filed by the Texas landowners, eminent domain is absolutely going to be an issue in this whole deal. And the White House via Sarah Huckabee Sanders yesterday said they expected these uh, challenges and they are preparing to defend them. Back to you, Charles. Phil, thank you very much. National Border Patrol Council President Brandon Judd has long supported whatever action the president wants to take to secure our southern border. So what does he think now? Brandon's with us. Brandon, uh, so the, it's, it's on, right? Uh, President Trump finally invoking those nas the national emergency powers. Uh, what do you make of the whole thing? We're, assess where we are at this moment. Well, I, I appreciate him in invoking uh, uh, national security. But what I'm really concerned about is I'm very concerned about this budget. I'm concerned with the provisions in the budget 
that allows for amnesty for those individuals that are even potential sponsors or household members of potential sponsors. If history is a guide, this is going to allow more uh, unaccompanied minors to work their way up through Mexico, which is very, very dangerous. It puts them in the hands of smugglers, um, and it's going to allow more UACs to come across the border illegally. If you look at people like uh, Congressman Chip Roy, who was a federal prosecutor, U.S. attorney, uh, when he says that there are some serious problems with this, we have to take a look at that, um, and we have to be very concerned. When Numbers USA, when CIS, when my organization is saying that there are some very serious concerns with this budget, we have to be concerned with how it's going to affect border security. Currently, how are uh, the, the border agents handling uh, you know, the, the situation here, the spotlight, and even news of additional caravans heading our way? Uh, our agents are doing a great job, and, and frankly, that is one thing that I'm very grateful uh, to President Trump for, is I'm grateful that, that he's given us uh, the morale boost that we need to go out there and do our job. When I put on my uniform next week, when I go out and I patrol the border, I know that I have an administration that has my back um, that's going to do uh, for my agents what's necessary for us to, to, to secure the border. Uh, so from that perspective, we're doing a good job. Our agents are doing a good job. Uh, we just have to get Congress to actually step up and do their job. In this budget deal, the Republicans got played. Uh, yesterday, there was a uh, Dan Crenshaw, a representative out of Texas, who I'm sure you know, put out a tweet and said, if you can snap your fingers and make the El Paso border wall disappear, would you? Uh, later on, uh, Beto O'Rourke, the former congressman and uh, failed uh, governor, uh, Senate candidate there, uh, was posed that same question. And he said, well, you know, 600 miles of walls and fencing have not demonstrably made us safer. Uh, and he would, if he could, snap his fingers and remove all of that. What do you make of that? That's dangerous talk, and Beto O'Rourke is just flat out wrong. If you look at the areas that I have patrolled in El Centro, California, in Naco, Arizona, where we built physical barriers, they worked. It, it caused illegal Im immigration to go down exponentially. It caused drug smuggling to go down exponentially. So if we look at what we've done, again, using history as a guide, it tells us that these physical barriers are, in fact, in fact, effective, and we need more of them. Uh, again, we need about 300 more miles of primary fencing, and if we can get that, we're gonna do a lot better uh, job in, in fact, securing the border. Brandon, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. So, was this move necessary, or does it set up a slippery slope? Here now to discuss Run for America founder David Bernstein, uh, Republican strategist Holly Turner, and Fox News contributor Deneen Borelli. Deneen, let me start with you. Uh, you know, one of the headlines that I saw, it changed, but for the most part, from mainstream media, was uh, that border apprehensions are at an all time low. Uh, but I went and looked at the data, and they were actually referring to 2017. I don't know how they missed 2018, which saw a 16% increase. Nevertheless, the idea is that this was not an emergency, uh, um, and that President Trump also is opening the door for future Democratic presidents to abuse the system. Well, that would be fallout anyway, because it's President Trump, no matter what he says or does. I think this was a good call for him to uh, call for this national emergency, because this is about the safety and security of Americans. The stats are startling. All you have to do is visit the website of the U.S. Border Patrol uh, Protection and look at the numbers of, of the drug traffickers, the human traffickers, the number of arrests that have been made, uh, women and children who are exploited. These are serious issues that are happening happening on our border, and the president wants to address these issues. So he had to make this move because uh, the Republicans, they had two years to do this, and they failed to make a move on something that is so crucial that's happening on our borders. David, how did this become such an issue? The idea, the notion that a sovereign nation uh, doesn't have the right to fortify uh, its, its border and, 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 and provide protection for its citizens. Well, look, uh, Democrats are not arguing uh, for the most part that we shouldn't have border security. I think there's a legitimate debate about how best to do it. And the process by which we do it is important. This has been a bipartisan issue on both sides for a long time. I think the president's move here to say this is an emergency, there are a whole host of issues in our country that are that are an emergency. And, and it does set a dangerous precedent. We don't want to abuse the system. This, this is on dubious constitutional ground on a lot of people's, on a lot of people's account, a lot of 
respectable legal legal folks say that. So I think it does set a dangerous precedent that Republicans are going to be complaining about, I'm sure, back on this panel if we have a Democratic president in a number of years. Holly? Well, listen, an emergency it is. The, we have 70,000 people dying every year from drug overdoses. The majority of those drugs are coming from our southern border. So to say that it's not an emergency is just fundamentally false. I um, mean, we talked about the angel moms that, uh, I mean, they've lost their loved ones. They're, in the past two years, there were 4,000 arrests of immigrants who are here illegally for killing. So this is a national emergency. I can't think of another issue that would be more important for a president to sign. And look, if Congress didn't want the president to have such broad measures when they passed the National Emergency Act in 1976, they would have put some very specific parameters around what a national emergency is. But they did not do that. They had the opportunity right. and they chose not to. And if they want to rescind it, they can. Uh, but the president has the authority to do this. You know, the main one thing that bothers me is uh, people who just are dead set against this, particularly in the media, they kind of focus on, well, you know, a place like El Paso, the crime is low and, and, and proponents of the wall are saying, well, yeah, it's, it's got wall. a wall. So right. take a look at San Diego. Look at the economies of San Diego and Tijuana after the wall went in place. Look at how they both sides of that wall have thrived and it makes a better argument for it. But no one to Holly's point talks about, you know, the interior of the nation. We've got a massive drug, drug epidemic in Long Island, New York. Yeah. You know, that doesn't get caught up or included in the, uh, in the conversation about securing our southern border. And there's also it's also known that you have MS-13 gang members in Long Island because they've been attacking and killing school children. So, and they're, and they're a threat to the, the neighborhoods and the society as a whole. Uh, but listen, it, this is about safety and security. I implore the Democrats to look in the faces of these angel families, to talk to these people and find out what they've gone through. What did they go through when they found out their loved one was killed, A, and B, what they, when they found out it was, they, it was at the hands of someone who should not have been here in the first place. They, they were they, at the press yeah, briefing I mean, yesterday. Right. I mean, I mean, it's, listen, it was the deplorable, to be quite frank with you, how the, the angel mothers and yes. those families have been sort of dismissed right. uh, by, by the media. But when you say there are other national emergencies out there, it, you know, this is not something where you don't have to, you know, we only could do one at a time. There are 31 national emergencies in existence, some that go back 40 years. Right. Uh, the idea, though, that you acknowledge that we do want to have something done there. President Trump wasn't, I don't know, necessarily asking for a lot. That was a $300 billion spending bill and a $21 trillion economy. Right. Well, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the problem exists on a couple fronts. Number one, if the president the actually wanted to build a wall to secure the southern border, he's going to need a lot more money than even what he's put in this budget to do it. And on the, sec on the other hand, if you're, if you're actually talking about solving this problem, this is a problem that has always needed a comprehensive solution that's more than about border security to the very good points about drug, you know, drugs coming into our country. You know, fentanyl is coming in from China just as much as it's coming in from, from it usually other goes places. to Mexico and then comes up, though, right? But, China but, sends it to Mexico but, and then it comes to but, our but, border. But, right, but the but the demagoguing that this is somehow just a problem of a bunch of drug drug mules, uh, like the plot of Sicaria, which I think was right. the last. Well, here, isn't it interesting said. though? Even if the, even if none of that was on the table, the idea that we should have the right to secure our borders the same way every American has a right to have a lock on their front door, it just seems like a no-brainer to me. By the way, guys, here's an interesting thing I read: with these states, uh, these national emergencies, uh, 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 they expire. They're supposed to expire every year. Right. Unless the president renews them, Senate and the House, they have to meet every six months to decide and consider a vote of termination. Well, in 40 years, Congress has never met once, not even once, let alone every six months. And that's why we still have national emergencies going back 40 years. But this is everyone's now worried about an abuse of national emergencies. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, massive fallout after fired FBI guy Andrew uh, McCabe says he and others discuss ways to get President Trump out now, his office, oh, they're trying to walk that back a little bit, but is the damage already done? Democrat Mark Penn, Mark Penn says, yes, we'll see what the former special counsel Ken Starr thinks. Both of the men are here. And we're about to get an update on that deadly workplace shooting in Illinois. What investigators are learning about the gunman? A shooting in Aurora, Illinois at the Henry Pratt Company building leaves six people dead, including the gunman and five police officers injured. Authorities now are revealing they believe the shooter and employee there was about to lose his job. So was this a case of workplace violence or, or was it something else? Fox News correspondent Jeff Paul is in Aurora with the latest. Jeff. Yeah, Charles, right behind me, that's the manufacturing facility where investigators say the suspected gunman walked inside with a handgun 
and began shooting. There, are, in fact, are still several police officers here piecing together what's being described as a very large crime scene. As you take a look at this picture, this is the suspect, 45-year-old Gary Martin. They say he was an employee at Henry Pratt and was about to be laid off. They believe he showed up to work yesterday, shooting and killing a total of five of his co-workers. One other co-worker was injured, as well as five officers who were shot. Those officers were some of the first to get to the scene and were running inside, hoping to save lives. Folks who live in the area near where the shooting happened say they still can't believe it happened. I've lived here for 39 years and I've never seen something like this in my life. And seeing just SWAT and police officers from all over the cities from everywhere, it's just insane. Now, after searching the building, police found the suspect engaged with him, eventually shooting and killing him. Investigators also searched his home here in Aurora, but didn't find anything suspicious. We're also learning the suspect had a criminal past that includes doing prison time for aggravated assault. Now, the mayor here in Aurora saying that the focus right now needs to be on the five victims who lost their lives so far. None of those names have been released yet. Charles. Jeff, uh, before we let you go, what what sort of uh, updates or what sort of insight do you think we can expect to hear uh, at this 11 o'clock update? I think the big thing that we're expecting, it's going to be happening 10 o'clock local here, 11 o'clock Eastern, uh, possibly some of the names of the victims, and then we can start putting more focus on on, on the people who lost their lives in this shooting. Um, other than that, it's, it's hard to really tell what we're going to get. The last update was about 12 hours ago. Still, as we mentioned in the intro, several police officers here going in and out of this building where that shooting happened. Charles. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, former FBI Director, Deputy Director Andrew McCabe trying to walk back comments released from his 60 Minutes interview. Republicans are demanding answers and a key Democrat advisor is too, Mark Penn is next. How is this happening in this country right now? Not only did it really happen, Charles, but they cast a net so wide without any, any real evidence on anyone. The only evidence they had was this dossier that the Clinton campaign paid for that came from Russians. And the irony in all this, and I know I can't say it enough times, the very thing that they were investigating the Trump campaign for, which was supposedly getting dirt from Russians to use against Hillary Clinton, that's exactly what the Clinton campaign did. And so, you know, I, I hope that the new AG gets in there and he starts to clean house and so that we can start to put the Department of Justice and the FBI back together again. Former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe telling CBS Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein raised high-level talks to consider how to kick the president out of office after Jim Comey's firing, and that Rosenstein was serious about his offer to wear a wire to record the president. Rosenstein denies it. But top Republicans are calling for hearings to get to the bottom of it, and now Andrew McCabe's office is saying, wait a minute, his comments were taken out of context, so what's going on here? Former Clinton advisor Mark Penn has some ideas. Mark joins us now. Mark, uh, what a tangled web. Uh, it, Explain to the audience what you think is happening here. Well, you can see why this group has earned the title Deep State. Uh, first, McCabe is pointing the finger at Rosenstein for trying to invoke the 25th Amendment and wiretap the president. Rosenstein says, hey, I didn't do that. But McCabe triggered the obstruction investigation and independent counsel. And on what basis did he did do so? Under, quote, the fear that he might be removed. He didn't do it on the basis of an actual crime that occurred. In fact, rather than being shunted away, McCabe was made acting head of the FBI. So rather than wait for a new FBI director to come in, be approved by the Senate, maybe look at these visa, FISA warrants, maybe see that some things were amiss with this dossier, maybe see that uh, Christopher Steele was fired for lying. Rather than that, they created the independent counsel so that they could have this investigation done by their own friends and supporters. And that's what was done here, and it's totally illegal. You know, I want to uh, uh, read part of a statement that was released uh, by McCabe's office uh, yesterday. Uh, part of it reads, at no time did Mr. McCabe participate in any extended discussions about the use of the 25th Amendment, nor is he aware of any such discussions. He was present and participated in a discussion that included a comment by 
Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein regarding the 25th Amendment. That's from Melissa, Melissa Schwartz, and she's a spokeswoman for Andrew McCabe. That was on, on Friday yesterday. Mark, uh, you know, I, when I saw the statement come across, I was like, whoa. I mean, because the way this is playing out, the 60 Minutes interview, almost an admission, for lack of a better word, a, a de facto coup that the FBI decided that they didn't like the, out, the outcome of this election, and they were plotting on how to count enough noses in the cabinet to, to pre possibly trigger a, a coup. Well, that's it. They didn't like the outcome of the election. And more importantly, they didn't like that their director was fired. And all of this was a retaliatory action for the director being fired, even though Rod Rosenstein wrote the memo to have him fired. They all got together and said, well, maybe we can use the 25th Amendment. Maybe we can get him out this way. Maybe we can hold a wire. Oh, maybe we can do an independent counsel. All in retaliatory action for the firing of James Comey. What a deep state. What a mess. McCabe was fired for lying. Who knows who is telling the truth here? All three of these top figures contradict each other multiple times on multiple stories. It, the, the overarching uh, theme here, though, is that you had the highest levels of the FBI who had... Uh, a degree, varying degrees of animus toward uh, candidate Trump and then President Trump. Uh, some who had actually talked about taking actions if somehow he were to win the election. And then we get evidence that the FBI uh, kicking around the idea of somehow invoking the 25th Amendment, getting eight of, tw eight of 15 cabinet members, nose counting, if you will, to go ahead and try to remove the duly elected president of the United States. This is shocking stuff. It is totally shocking stuff. It is the making of movies like Seven Days in yeah. May. It is everything we grew up fearing about the people that we give the greatest trust to in the government. The 25th Amendment does not apply to the FBI. It applies to people in Congress, in the cabinet, for extraordinary circumstances, typically related to the health and uh, of the president of the United States, none of which had any application here whatsoever. The whole thing is incredible, but even if they didn't use the 25th Amendment, what they did was trigger a series of things that now has created a two-year investigation. And look, there's a new attorney general coming in. Mm -hmm. And look, the attorney general should tell Robert Mueller, hey, wrap this up, get out your conclusions, and you know what? If you want to continue investigating, how about having Democrats and Republicans on your investigation team? How about having a balanced team in order to have credibility? Make some changes that are constructive if Robert Mueller isn't ready to finally give his report and move on. Mark Penn, thank you very much. Thank you. Protesters got their way, but what about the 25,000 people who were hopeful of getting a new job when Amazon... It shows that everyday Americans still have the power to organize and fight for their communities, and they can have more say in this country than the richest man in the world. New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez taking heat for seeming to celebrate Amazon's decision to leave New York before they even got here. Uh, now she's, well, she's trying to clarify those comments at the Fox Business Network's Tracy Carrasco with the fallout. Tracy. Good morning. Yes, a stunning announcement on Thursday. Amazon canceling its planned HQ2 project for New York City. 25,000 potential jobs no longer coming to the proposed Long Island City, Queens location. In a blog post, Amazon called out state and local politicians for their opposition to the second headquarters and suggested that is what motivated the company to pull out of the deal. Freshman and Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who represents the Bronx and Queens, initially celebrated the decision as a victory, but backtracked her comments on Friday when asked about the criticism she received for celebrating the loss of 25,000 jobs. What this is a celebration of is that everyday people in the community stood up and they wanted a say in what was happening in their own backyard. You know, it's not, um, it's not the community's fault that the moment they said, hey, what are the details of this? Where are the benefits coming from? Can we secure more? You know, they, wanted, they came to the negotiating table and Amazon said, we're not going to negotiate anything, we're just going to wait. 
Governor Andrew Cuomo, a major supporter of the project, putting the blame on Ocasio-Cortez and others. He said, quote, a small group of politicians put their own pol narrow political interests above their community, which poll after poll showed overwhelmingly supported bringing Amazon to Long Island City, the state's economic future and the best interests of the people of this state. The New York State Senate has done tremendous damage. They should be held accountable for this lost economic opportunity. Mayor Bill de Blasio expressing his frustration with Amazon saying, quote, we gave Amazon the opportunity to be a good neighbor and do business in the greatest city in the world. Instead of working with the community, Amazon threw that opportunity, threw away that opportunity. De Blasio said there was no discussion before Amazon made up its mind. Amazon said it would continue to develop the other half of HQ2 in Northern Virginia, as well as the new office in Nashville, Tennessee. As for those other cities vying for Amazon's business during the year-long search, Amazon said it is not considering any other locations at this time. Tracy, thank you very much. Well, Queens Chamber of Commerce President Thomas Gretsch says the city borough is far, is far along in its plans to welcome and support Amazon, and he joins us now. Uh, are, do you feel though this, this is a done deal, right? Amazon saying they're not going to look back. Uh, so whatever you guys had thought you were going to get done, that's done. Good morning, Charles. Thanks for having me this morning. I don't think you never say never, especially in the city of New York. I think there's just been such a groundswell since the announcement on uh, on Valentine's Day regarding this. All day, all day Friday, we got calls uh, to my office, emails, texts, and that includes members of the uh, of the formed Community Advisory Council of 45 people, including people from the neighboring uh, housing projects at the Queensbridge houses that were deeply, deeply committed and deeply, deeply involved in every aspect of this. And business is a negotiation. We were just getting ourselves started to get to get our, our, right. our, our arms and our hands around this thing. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't go our way right now. Some opponents will point to the largest housing project uh, in, in that neighborhood. And of course, the development of a new opportunity zone uh, as one of the reasons why the uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's of the world didn't want this project, thinking that, hey, yeah, they're going to be some great paying jobs. But no one in those projects would be able to get those jobs. And the only thing that would happen is that the Starbucks would come in, the Whole Foods would come in, rents would go up, and eventually all the people who've been living there for several generations will be pushed out. What do you, what do you say about that? I, I totally and wholeheartedly disagree. We have engaged the folks over there with maybe the largest job opportunity in the last 75 years and the next 25 years. We've embraced people like April Simpson, who runs the, the Tenant Association at the Queensburg Projects, uh, Bishop Taylor, who uh, was born and raised there, as was his family. We, we were all over this project to get those people jobs, finally find a way for 25,000 jobs. Let me just say, too, people in the chambers of commerce business, people like me in the Bronx and Brooklyn and all the other ones, the lengths that we go to keep a company of 50, 25 people to stay in the city of New York would astound most people instead of having them go south or to Connecticut right. or New Jersey. Well, on that note then, Thomas, does it bother you a little bit that there aren't lower taxes offered to smaller businesses? In other words, you know, a lot of people are saying, golly, the richest man in the world, does he need $3 billion break? And what about the person that wants to open up a local t-shirt shop? When, when you know, is, is there something inherently wrong when these big companies can get all of these sort of tax breaks and a small business or would be business can't. I do not, I do not agree with that, that, that position. Um, the New York City Department of uh, Small Business Services has some great programs to help. And that's for the tax policies, the, the breaks. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, do you, you understand that the sort of sure. the other side of the argument here, I'm not saying that they're right, but mm -hmm. it's gaining momentum. It's gaining momentum in the Democratic Party. It's gaining momentum against young adults. And, and it's the sort of thing, it's a pushback against American style capitalism that I'm really worried about because, and I think this is the, now has been, your borough has now become the epicenter of it. I would agree. I think that the $3 billion was a program that was available to any other company. We just happened to land uh, a large, large opportunity. And I I think it was all based upon, those incentives were based upon the jobs they were going to deliver, period, and that's the way it works. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you for very right. much. Uh, a national emergency that isn't getting any headlines. No, I'm not talking about the border wall, but it does involve government spending. Find out how a major problem just got a whole lot worse. 
You're looking live at 2020 presidential candidate, New Jersey Democrat Senator, Senator Cory Booker, holding a rally in New Hampshire. Booker and the other 2020 hopefuls promising and supporting new big government programs from Medicare for all to the Green New Deal. That just as our national debt tops $22 trillion this week. Congratulations, America. Now, neither party uh, really talking about cutting spending. So is this the real national emergency? The Fox News contributor Jonas Max Ferris, Fox Business Network Susan Lee, and CPA market analyst Dan Geltrude. Uh, Susan, let me start with you. Twenty-two trillion and counting. We paid uh, over five hundred billion last year in interest. To serve soon, it. it will be a trillion dollars a year. You can buy all the border wall you want with it. Almost all the Medicare for all. You can do a lot with a it's trillion a dollars. It's a lot. It's a lot. So it's up two trillion dollars under the Trump administration. But on an annual average basis, it's less per year than the entire. Obama eight-year tenure. However, you're right. It does have a market impact. It does have an economic impact because we have to service it and pay it somehow. And that drains money, by the way, from the U.S. economy. Can we be honest and say that neither party is ever going to do anything about it? I mean, I mean, are we inevitably going to have to hit the cliff? You know, listen, in Greece, you know, there was someone out there for years in Greece saying, guys, we can't just keep paying 14 uh, months of salary for 12 months of work. We can't let people go on five-month vacations. We can't let people retire at age 50 because they worked in a beauty salon and dangerous hair chemicals. We can't keep doing this. They still hit the wall. Yeah, I, well, we're going to hit a wall. I don't know why. It's, it used to be uh, the thing that the other party was out of power would bring up. But now it's like they're kind of off that. It's a little bit more about what we're going to spend money on. In fact, what, the thing that bugs me the most about the, the Democrats about this is they're not even playing the, you know, there's inequality. And they've talked about raising taxes. There's been a lot of tax proposals. But their spending proposals are bigger than the tax proposals. So the problem's not going to go away. Funny thing is the European countries that have all these social programs, the free health, they have lower debt to, to GDP ratios than America, and they borrow at lower rates because they have this under control. We're the ones who've lost control. The Democrats who want to go into a, so, a socialism-type model don't have a plan that has the tax revenue base of a European country. I would country. say the U.S. is still more contained than, say, Europe, not Europe, but China and Japan at 250 Japan's of the debt only, to GDP. really the only major economy. China's also at 260, well, 280. As well. The difference is a country like Japan and most of Europe borrows at negative interest rates. We do we have, do not have that luxury getting to your five hundred billion dollar. We borrow at fairly high rates now relative to the rest of the world who has their debt under control. So our interest payments as a percentage of GDP, which is really all that right. matters, Japan is a negative interest rate doesn't matter, is a problem area that's going to get really bad if the rate goes Dan, higher. You're a numbers man. Uh, uh, a few years ago, these numbers shocked us. When we first saw that debt clock, we were like, whoa, you know, I mean, this is something almost everyone agreed was a major, major issue. We've become numb to him, but you're a numbers guy. I mean, talk about the impact of this. Yeah, I think we have become numb to it, even though I am a numbers guy. Nobody's talking about it anymore, Charles. If you go back to 2001, you had uh, the national debt running at 31 percent of GDP. Now we're up to 76% of GDP for our national debt. It's unsustainable. Ten years from now, but but when someone watching saying, but then someone watching saying, okay, you know what? We've been warned. Like maybe we overwarned people. Maybe we were too hysterical about it because we didn't go over a cliff. And now it's the boy who cried wolf. I mean, uh, you know. So how do? This is a, a huge, a, a huge issue. It's a huge emergency, and no one's talking about it. Because the number is too big, Charles. And let me tell you what I mean by that. If you took the average person and said, you have $50 million worth of credit card debt, you know what they'd say? Who cares? I'm never going to be able to pay that. Unfortunately, I think our national debt is getting to such a number, we realize we can't pay it. So are we going to go off the cliff? Yes, we're going to go off the cliff before anybody's going to do anything about it. Because politicians are buying votes, re-electionism, right? Through all this spending, that's never going to end unless we're going to do something really bold like term limits. On the Democratic side, the number one issue is that the Earth's temperature will get one degree warmer in 100 years. Well, you know, we're looking at $22 trillion in debt in our face right now. Yeah. And yet that can't uh, elicit any sort of anxiety or fear. Are you talking about the Green New Deal? Which uh, all all of these deals that, you know, it's just, uh, you know, the 